morning, church. Merry Christmas, and uh, we made it to the last Sunday of 2020. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. That is a victory in and of itself. So we are um, we're coming to the end, and as we get to the end, I always like to reflect on the past year. There's been a lot to reflect on in 2020, almost more than we have the capacity to. Uh, but there's been a lot of good that's happened in 2020, and I uh, expect 2021 to be another year where God just proves his faithfulness to us um, again and again. <clears throat> But one of the things that Camille and I had the opportunity to do this past year, and it's becoming more frequent lately, I think it's due to our age or maybe stage of life, is we get to go to a lot of weddings every year. Um, I, all, a lot of our friends are getting married now, some extended family, and I love weddings. I'm, I don't love it because I'm a romantic. I don't love it because I'm hallmarky and love like the, the sappy rom-com. I love it because of the food and I love it because of the people. But neither, even though it's about love, even though it's about people's commitment to each other, um, we still go to these weddings. They were socially distanced. It was a fun time. It was definitely different. But at every wedding, it always makes me, causes me to reflect on Camille and I's wedding day. And it was a day in our lives that was marked by our love and commitment to each other. And so every time we go to a wedding, it causes me to reflect on our own marriage and our own wedding day. And a particular moment on our wedding day always comes to mind. And it actually happened 30 minutes before the ceremony. And so Camille and I decided we didn't want to do a first look. So we wanted the first time of me seeing her in her get up. I'm gonna call it a get up. I know it's like a wedding dress and she put a lot of effort into the face and all that kind of stuff. But the first, we wanted the first time of me to see her being when she walked down the aisle. But we still wanted the time for us to connect prior to the ceremony where it was just us away from everyone else, away from the craziness of the wedding day festivities. And of course, there's always a photographer with you when you're um, with someone else. And so we decided to meet up at the corner of the church that we were getting married at. She was on one side of the corner, I was on the other. We did it in a way where we didn't see each other. But we spent a few minutes just holding each other's hand, praying over each other, and reading a letter that we wrote to each other um, in that moment. And still to this day, it is one of my favorite memories of our wedding day, is that moment that we had in that that time to, to share our, our longing to be with one another. Uh, it's an, we also acknowledge that I don't wanna be with anyone else but you. And it was just a time for me and her to express our love and devotion for one another. And so a few weeks ago, I actually pulled out these letters and read them to remind myself, and it just took me back to that moment. It took me back to the feelings I experienced in that moment when I was about to, to be married to the love of my life. And it reminded me that in that moment, I was madly in love with Camille, and I am still madly in love with my wife today. But it just, it gave me a picture of this love relationship that we had. And I have a question for, for our church this morning, myself included. And that is, right here, right now, wherever you're sitting, whether you're at home, on your couch, maybe you're driving, maybe you watch this three hours from now, maybe you're in a few here right now. Does that type of love relationship, that longing, that being overwhelmed by love, that acknowledgement that you are the only one, does that signify or mark your relationship with God? Right here, right now, can you confidently say that my heart is in love with God? That is a question that I've wrestled with a lot this past year, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Quarantine and COVID years do a lot of random things to you, and being disconnected from our gathered body and just experiencing the circumstances of the world, I hit a point in my spiritual life where it was dry, where my life, I hit a point of spiritual apathy where everything was bland. And I'm willing to bet I'm not the only one in here that has experienced that this year. Maybe you're experiencing that this moment where your relationship with God is more marked by duty 
than it is delight. I remember going to the Word and praying and reading and not having my affection stirred for Christ. And I just hit this dry, dry season. So in order to help stir my affections for God, I started reading the Psalms each morning and praying through the Psalms. And the Psalms are, great, are a great help for us when we experience dry seasons because the Psalms put words in your mouth. They train you and teach you how you ought to feel and speak to God, with God, and to yourself. And so when you go to the Psalms, you actually get a picture of human experience that all of us can relate to on different levels. And so they show us the emotions that we should be feeling and give us words for the emotions that we are feeling. And so when you read the Psalms, you realize that you're not alone in your experience and what you are feeling. And so as I was reading through the Psalms, I came across Psalm 63, which will be our passage this morning, and it stopped me right in my tracks. I couldn't get through it. It was, I am not an emotional guy, um, I, uh, but it was hard for me to walk through this Psalm because it was exactly what God needed to show me in order to get through a season of spiritual apathy and blandness in my life. And so Psalm 63 is a psalm of David. He writes this psalm. He writes this psalm while he is in the wilderness fleeing for his life. So commentators are actually split on what stage of David's life this is. Some believe it is earlier in his life when he's fleeing from Saul. Others believe it's later when he's already reigned as king for a time and his son Absalom um, rises up against him and he flees for his safety there. But his circumstances are the same. He is in a position of weakness. He's in an area where he is in the desert physically and spiritually. He is without food, water, a place to sleep, and protection. And so you would expect this psalm, given the circumstances, to read like a psalm of lament of David crying out, why me, God? How long until things are made right? But it actually reads more like a psalm of praise, which is what struck me so hard. And so in this psalm, you're gonna see a complex man. He's almost seems schizophrenic at times because you can tell he's so overwhelmed with wanting God. He pings back and forth between his past experiences, his present circumstances, and his future hope, and it's all kind of this jumbled up mess of a prayer that he gives to God that was written down for us. And you also see a man, which I want us to see this morning, a man whose heart is deeply in love with God. A man who wants God more than anything else that this world has to offer. And so the question that arises for us this morning when we read this psalm is, do you want God? The question isn't, do you believe in God, or even do you worship God, or do you trust God? The question is, at this very moment, do you want God? Do you want God more than anything and anyone else in this world? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm 63. You can read along with me. Just for the sake of this psalm, I'll read it all in one kind of entirety, and then we'll kind of walk through it um, verse by verse. Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. 
and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword, and they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning um, asking you to give us a desire for yourself. God, we confess that we often love things more than we love you, that we often desire things or people more than we desire you. And so this morning as we read this psalm, I pray that you will prove to us your love for us and that we will receive it and that even within this next hour that there will be someone here today that comes to the realization of how great your love is for them. And so, God, I pray for those in this room who are spiritually dry at this moment. I pray that as we walk through this psalm and as we worship as a church, that you will just stir their affections and bring life to their spiritual lives once again. And we trust you in that. We trust you in this moment to do all of those things. We pray that you'll be glorified in this time. We praise, we praise your name. Amen. So one of the first things we see in the psalm in the very first verse says, Oh God, my God, you are my God. David uses very personal language when he speaks about God. For David, God is not some far off deity. It is someone that you can have a relationship with. It's language that you would use for someone that you are in close relationship with. It's someone that can be sought after. So God is personal to David. It's someone that he can seek, and he says, earnestly I seek you, which can also be translated as early in the morning do I seek you. So it gives us this picture of a man who has a relationship with God to where the moment his eyes open in the morning, he is seeking after God. His desire is marked by urgency and clarity. You cannot mistake what David is seeking after. It is clear from the very first verse what, who David is seeking after. He's not seeking after an experience. He's not seeking his throne back. He's not seeking protection or comfort or any of the necessities that he would need to live in the wilderness or the desert. He is alone seeking God. And this desire for God becomes so strong that he begins to feel it in his body. David is in a position where, again, he is without food and water and sleep, he has gone days probably without a significant amount of water and food. And so he takes his physical longing that he has for water, his physical thirst, and compares it to the thirst and the desire that he has for God. And the best way that he knows how to describe this spiritual longing is just to take what he's feeling in that moment and say, what I'm feeling this moment physically is what my heart feels for you, God. The same way his body is thirsting for water is the same way that his soul is thirsting for God. And this concept of thirsting is all throughout your Bible. We're not gonna hit all of the verses. There'd be too many to read in the Sunday morning, um, but I wanna bring to attention a few of them. Psalm 42, one, two says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so, my, so pants my soul for you. 
O oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Matthew 5, 6, on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he opens up and says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then later on in his teaching in John 7, 37, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So the Bible, your Bibles often communicate thirst and compare it to a spiritual longing that we all have for God or that we should have for God. And one of the greatest difficulties for us to actually understand the depth of what David is experiencing in this moment is that we in the Western world do not really understand what thirst is. We rarely go hours without drinking something. We rarely go a day or two without eating. But the, what thirst does for you, if you've gone hours or days without thirst, your body begins to ache and you begin to feel it to your core. So he's taking the, his, his most tangible experience of this thirst, this deep-seated thirst, and saying, this is what my heart is longing after, but for God, not water. It's a desire that if left unsatisfied will cause your body not to function in the way that it was intended to function anymore. And so David is in a position that if he does not satisfy this thirst, he may die. But from this verse, you can see that David is far more concerned with being with God than he is with even the necessities of life. And that begs the, the question for us of, to what degree do you thirst for God? Do you thirst for God in this way? He goes on in verse two and says, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. So after expressing his deep desire to be with God, David now reflects on his past experiences with God. And as a result of being in the wilderness, David does not have access to the sanctuary that he once worshiped God in. At this point in time, God would actually come down and meet his people in the tabernacle. And David is reflecting and longing on this corporate public worship that he would partake in and lead in. He says, in those moments when I looked upon you in the sanctuary, I saw two things. I saw your power and I saw your glory. And isn't that one of the primary purposes of us gathering as a church? Isn't that why it's important for us to gather when we're able to? When we gather at 328 Meeting Street and when we gather virtually online at this time, isn't the goal to leave this place worshiping God because you were witnesses to the power and glory of God? That we would leave this place worshiping. And David longs for this public worship so much because it's the closest expression that we have to heavenly worship. And that's why it's so important not to neglect this meeting because it's when we behold and see the power and the glory of God. But don't be mistaken, David isn't looking back on these days and thinking it as the good old days. Oh, I can't wait till I get back then. He's using it as a way to build his confidence He's looking back as a reminder that the eternal God doesn't change. Time does not alter God. The seasons come and go, but God remains the same. And it is off of this consistency of God that we can have confidence and faith that the way that he showed his power and his glory in the past, he will surely do it again in the future because he is consistent in the midst of an inconsistent life. So this is a guy with big God theology. He is trusting God. He knows God will continue to show his power and glory as he continues on in life. And then we get to verse three, which is the verse that st stopped me in my tracks. He said, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you so I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. 
Steadfast love can be translated as faithful love, but I don't want us to miss the gravity of what David just communicated in this moment. David is arguably taking the most important thing to us and comparing it to the steadfast love of God. Think for a minute what you are willing to give up in order to preserve your life. Imagine this morning, if you walk out this church, on your way to your car, you're taking your keys out, and a man with a gun comes and attempts to rob you and says, if you do not give me everything in your pockets at this moment, I will shoot you where you stand. Wouldn't you in that moment give him all of the money on you in order to preserve your life? Maybe you go in for a checkup with the doctor. You go in a, and the doctor comes in, she says, we found something. In order for you to live a healthy and long life, you are going to have to undergo a very painful and drawn out procedure. Wouldn't you in that moment pick preserving your life over comfort? At every turn, we pick the preservation of our life and the lives of those we love over anything. But David is taking this, the most important thing that we hold to ourselves, our life, and saying, I pick God every time because his steadfast love is better than life. But why is it? Why is God's steadfast love better than life? It's because his love lasts longer than life. Nothing can touch the love that God has for his children. It is better because it lasts longer than life. David is in a wilderness stripped of everything, his comforts, his title, his security. But he can have hope in the fact that God loves him. His enemies can take it all away. He might never... In this moment, he, might not, he doesn't know if he's going to get his throne back or his position back. But they cannot touch that one thing, the love that God has for David. And I don't know about you. I, I, I imagine more often than not, I cannot honestly say that God's love is better than life. I think it intellectually. I know that's the right answer. But when you actually look at my life, do I live in such a way where I actually believe that God's love is better than what this world has to offer? Do you believe that the steadfast love of God is better than job satisfaction? Do you believe that the steadfast love of God is better and greater than the love that you receive from your spouse or your children? Do you believe that the steadfast love of God is more fulfilling and more satisfying than being at the top of your profession and having all of the comforts that this world has to offer? Do you believe that the steadfast love of God lasts longer than the momentary satisfaction you get from the vices of this world. And it's because of tasting and seeing the steadfast love of God, David is able to commit himself, his life, to the worship and glory of God. Even when all the good gifts, all of the things that he has given have been taken away, he can still confidently say that the most important thing about me, the fact that God loves me, was not taken and so he continues on in verse five and says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Because of God's steadfast love, David has confidence that one day all of his desires will be fulfilled completely and perfectly. And he compares it, he takes the hunger that he feels in that moment and says that the mo when I see Jesus, when I get God, the satisfaction is going to be like taking this hunger and satisfying with the richest and fattest foods at my disposal. If you've known me for long, people that are close to me know this, 
is I have a special place in my heart for Wendy's 4 for 4. So, Wendy's, uh, if you're not aware, um, Wendy's is a fast food restaurant. Um, as far as the ranking goes, it's Chick-fil-A Wendy's. Um, but Wendy's is great. They have a deal called 4 for 4, and you get four items for $4. I know, I'm not making it up. It's a real deal. It's incredible. You can get a drink, fries, chicken nuggets, and your choice of a sandwich. I always go with the junior bacon cheeseburger, but you can go fried chicken sandwich if you'd like. Um, but that is my sweet spot. I have a sweet spot for cheap food in my life. That Little Caesars is the best pizza out there. You're not gonna argue with me about it. Um, but if it was up to me, I would eat Wendy's every day. If it was up to me, when my wife and I go on date nights, we'd be hitting up Wendy's. <laughs> Thankfully, it is not up to me. Because Wendy's is cheap. It's cheap food, I recognize it. You eat Wendy's and a few hours later, you are hungry again. It satisfies you for a moment. It's all that MSG and stuff, it gets you for a moment. But it does not last. You don't savor a hamburger from Wendy's. You eat it as quickly as you can. It's much different than going down the street and going to Hall's Chop House. Camille and I went to Hall's Chop House this year. It was an incredible experience. Uh, I will never have a better dining experience in my life. It was phenomenal. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not pu publicizing Hall's. I, they don't pay me to do this, um, but it was great. Um, Camille got pork chops. I had a dry-aged Kansas City Strip steak. It was incredible. And when you eat at Hall's, you get the nicest food available to you, and you savor every single bite. We were there for like two and a half to three hours. Like if we go to Wendy's, it's 10 minutes max. And, it would have, and I have never been more satisfied and fulfilled by a meal in my life. Like I felt it like days after, like I didn't even have to eat breakfast the next morning because it was so incredible and satisfying. But how ridiculous would it have been for me in that moment to think of a Wendy's hamburger? To on our way home that night being like, babe, you know, we should, we should hit up Wendy's. I got a four for four, we'll split it. You get the chicken nugs, I get the bacon cheeseburger. That would have been ridiculous because you do not go to a fast food restaurant after you have just tasted and been fulfilled by Hall's Chop House. And the same is true when you have tasted the goodness of God. When you've experienced the steadfast love of God in your life and you've really received it this, and you experience the satisfaction of knowing God and being known by him, everything else pales in comparison. Everything else is a Wendy's hamburger. And this is why we worship. We don't worship God just because he's great, which he is, and that is enough for us to, for, uh, for him to deserve and grant worship from us. But we worship God because he is good. When we have tasted and seen that God is good, our worship becomes delight and no longer duty. We are able to praise God with joyful lips like we see here, even when the world takes everything of value away from us because we recognize the satisfaction of knowing the giver is much greater than the gifts that the giver provides. But David has this hunger. He has this thirst, and we have not seen this thirst satisfied yet. And we go into this next verse in verse six, and he says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you on the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy, my soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. David goes to bed hungry. He goes to bed still wanting. He goes to bed still longing after God. And that is okay. All of our desires and were not meant to be fulfilled in this life. We, were, we are citizens of a different kingdom, of a different world. 
And so the desires that we have, the desires of longing after God, that is a healthy desire that God has given for you so that you long for his kingdom to come so that you can actually experience the perfect and complete fulfillment of those desires. C.S. Lewis, as um, you've probably heard this quote before, he says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. You see, David's hunger for God is so strong that he is unable to sleep. It is as if he is a man that is madly in love and he cannot get the object of his love out of his mind in order to settle his soul and go to sleep. He is tossing and turning at night, consumed with his desire for God. This is a picture of a man with a healthy obsession and hunger for God. And if you're honest with yourself, and if I'm honest with myself, that hunger can be lacking at times, that my thoughts are more often consumed with things other than God and his glory and the goodness that he has shown me through Jesus Christ. And so what do you daydream about when nothing else is fighting for your attention? What are you hungering for? These things that we hunger for and dream about, they typically consist of other things that our hearts have fallen in love with, probably very good things. But when our hearts love and are captivated by these things, when they cling to these things more than they cling to God, we become idolaters. We worship the gift without worshiping the giver of that gift. But when we See David, his soul is captivated by nothing other than God. There is no rival in David's heart. David then begins to reflect on God's faithful provision. He says, your right hand will uphold me. So David, God's faithful provision in the past gives him confidence of his faithful provision provision in the future. Even though he's in real danger, he is confident that God will win. So in these eight verses, we have just seen a man who is weak and needy, yet fully dependent upon God. And we live in a world where this weakness, this type of neediness is not celebrated. We live in a world where it's much more, it's better to be self-sufficient. That's championed among the country that we live in. But in order to hunger, In order to thirst, in this way, we must recognize and accept our inability. We must recognize and accept our inability to bring about the things that we want and desire in our life. David is completely unable. He is weak. He is in a position where there's, he is at the mercy of God and his enemies. So you need to recognize, we need, I need to recognize that I am unable to satisfy the longings of my heart. I am unable to control the circumstances and the outcomes of my life. And even when I'm, when I'm left to myself, I am unable to love God. It's only because God first loved me that I'm even able to reciprocate any type of love and affection for God. So David wants God at the level of food, drink, sleep, and protection. And this is why he can pray this prayer, because he is desperate and because he is needy. But let's see how he ends. He says, but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down in the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God, and all who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Only now does David shift his attention to what we would consider his most pressing need, the fact that he is in a wilderness with an enemy greater than he is. And given your, his expectation, or given his circumstances, you would expect this to be at the very top of his prayer. Because for us, that would be the most pressing need, this physical safety that he is having in this moment. But if you just look at the sheer amount of volume 
of verses that David, uh, I guess, gives to his devotion to God and his plea for help at the end, you would see without a doubt that David is far more concerned with being with God than he is with victory over his enemies. But David is still confident. He's confident that God will provide a final and decisive victory over his enemies, one that he is unable to do himself. He's completely unable to win this battle. He's got an enemy much greater than he is. But he is confident that his enemies will end up in the dirt or as roadkill. And so a body left for jackal signifies um, when a very wicked enemy was killed in battle because of how wicked they were, they would never give them a proper burial. So they would leave them out in order to be consumed by wild beasts and jackals. And that's what David is communicating here, that this enemy will be defeated and decisively, and their wickedness will be known because of the judgment that they will have from being eaten by jackals. And he'll be restored to his rightful place And David is likely viewing this as a temporary victory, but it always points to a a future and final victory for God's people, one that God will also win decisively. So this is not only a redemption from evil, this is a redemption that David experiences that allows him to step in to fellowship and enjoy God once again. And even when things look bleak, even when the tables are stacked against David, he can still have confidence confidence that God will win this battle. So we have just seen, as we come to the psalm, we have just seen a man who is hungering after God. We see a man who has this big God theology. He trusts God to win his battles, but man, he is still sad. He is left unsatisfied, and he wants God more than anything else. And so to end, I want to circle back to the question that I posed at the beginning. Is your heart in love with God? The reason I ask this is because there's a very real danger in a church like ours, which is great, where we put a high, a very big importance on the word of God and we reflect on the bigness of God, that we can sometimes engage God with our minds, but not engage God at the level of our affections that we can allow, we can believe the right things, but the right things can seldom work its way into how we feel. That we can leave here feeling unmoved at times. You can go to, you can learn a lot of great things and feel your affections not stirred for God. But as we just saw, David is a guy with big God theology, but he's also a guy who is obsessed and hungry for God. And I wanna ask, does this characterize your life? Is your life marked by an obsessive addiction for God? Or is it marked by a convenient addition of God? Is your worship marked by duty, I have to do this, or delight that God invites me into his life and as a worshiper? Is your life marked by a love for the giver or the gifts? I don't know where each of you stand this morning. This may have been the most difficult year that you've experienced up to this day. You might be in a wilderness or desert place right here. You might have been there for three years and you're still in it. Some of you might see the light at the end of the tunnel. Some of you might not see how this will ever end. But I want to ask, I want to kind of reflect a little bit. Could it be that God may have you in the wilderness or in a dry point at this point in your life so that you might develop a thirst and a hunger for him? Could it be that God has stripped you of all of your comforts and security so that you can have delight in being fully dependent upon him? Could it be that maybe this year people that you've loved have let you down so that you can recognize and come to the realization that God's steadfast love is better 
than life. If we're honest, our love and affections for God grow cold. And so the natural question is, how can we manufacture this, right? What do I need to do in order to love God more? And the answer that the Bible gives is that you can't manufacture it. You can put yourself in positions to encounter the grace of God through studying his word and through praying and to to being a part of a body of believers. But the overwhelming answer that the Bible gives us to stir our affections for God is to recognize and realize the greatness of God's love for you and to accept it and receive it, to really receive that love. God invites you not to a religion characterized by cold and monotonous routine. God invites you at this very moment to relationship that is marked by delight, adoration, joy, affection, and love. Jesus is inviting you to a love relationship that makes all of your other relationships in this world look like hate in comparison of how much you love Jesus. The God of the universe loves you even though you have rebelled against him, even though you are dead in your sin, even though you by nature do not desire God, and even though you deserve eternal separation and punishment because of your sin, God has made a way for you to experience his love again. And it's through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you can receive this love today and experience a forgiveness of sin and a love that is better than life itself. And the good news of the gospel is not that we get satisfaction or forgiveness or joy. Those are incredible things. Those are things that we should desire and those are things available to us in Jesus Christ. But the good news of the gospel is that you and I get God. As I read through the psalm, I was struck with the reality that for David, God was not a means to an end. God was the end. David didn't ask for safety. He didn't ask for comfort. He didn't ask for his throne back. He asked for God. And that's what you and I get when we trust in Jesus. We get God and we get God forever. We get the author and source of all life and love. And we get a love that lasts longer than life and one that is better than life itself. And so there are probably two types of people here this morning. There is probably those who actually hunger and thirst for a God, but you, for whatever reason, you might be left unsatisfied in this world. And then there's another group of people that maybe you're watching or here this morning where you can't honestly say that I've ever thirsted or hungered for God before in my life. So for that first group, take heart. What you are experiencing is exactly what God intended you to experience. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he cries out, he rejects the wine, he cries out, I thirst. Jesus knows what it's like to be left unsatisfied. Jesus knows what it's like to thirst after God. So you are in good company. And Jesus rejected the wine and thirsted after God on the cross so that you and I will one day have that thirst and that hunger fulfilled completely in knowing Jesus. And for the second group, those who may have never thirsted for God before, I'd like to ask you, ask you to consider the gospel this morning. James 1, 12 and 2, 5, James communicates that heaven is prepared for those who love God. And we are only able to love God when we receive the God that love that receive the love that God has extended to you and me. So again, when Jesus was on the cross, he thirsted and he took the weight of our sin, our shame, and our punishment and our disobedience on the cross, and he took our penalty and died the death that we deserve and was risen to life 
so that people who would never naturally thirst for God might have an opportunity to thirst for God. So that people who live in this world unfulfilled by the things of this world might find a satisfaction and a love that is better than life itself. A love that has proved itself again and again on the cross. So if that is you this morning, I just ask you to consider the gospel that there is a God that loves you more than you could ever comprehend or imagine and that life and love is available to you at this moment through Jesus Christ and all you have to do is receive it. That's all we do as Christians is just to receive the love of God. And that is our security in life and death. Our security is not that we love God as much as we ought to. If that was our security, we would have no assurance. We have no assurance of being with God forever. But our security is that Jesus loves us when he ought not to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this picture that you give us in Psalm 63 of a man who is dependent and weak and desperate where everything has been taken from him, but he has you. And he can say confidently that your love is better than life itself. And so I pray for those in this room here. I pray for those who are at home listening. I pray that in these moments right now, that you will convince the people here that you have a love that is so great, so vast, so deep, so wide, that it's gonna be, that it's greater than what this world has to offer. And I pray this right now that someone will receive this love and realize that they can be loved by God because of what Jesus has done for them. And so I pray for those who are dry right now, I pray that you, as we reflect on this message, as we reflect through singing and worship, that you will just stir up their affections for you and that you will grow for them a desire for you that only you can put there. And that we will long as a church for that desire to be completely fulfilled and satisfied when Jesus comes back to restore all things new. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.